people coming in as participants. Is that what you wanted? Not really, but <laughs> guess what? As long as they still see raised hands on the side. Let's see, we've got Okay, we're just waiting to see if anyone else comes in here. Okay. Looks like I'll have to admit each as they come in. So it looks like we've got about 19 or 20 people here. I disable the waiting room. Got it. Okay. So um, welcome everyone. Glad you could join us this afternoon. One of two of these uh, webinars that we're going to have at three o'clock and again at six o'clock this evening. Uh, they're being recorded so that we can post them to the county's YouTube and put links to them wherever we need to to get the word out. My name is Jamie Wagamuth. I'm the Lebanon County Chief Clerk. And uh, if you're here, you already know that there's CARES funding available for grants to small businesses, nonprofits, tourism related businesses. And it is the county's task to, uh, to spread that money around to the various applicants who are eligible, meet the eligibility requirements and so on. And um, so I welcome you all to this. Um, hopefully you had a chance to, to see our uh, landing page at LebanonCountyCares.com, the application and the frequently asked questions, uh, everything we have available there. Um, we, um, we've had to do this rather quickly, and um, so it's, it may not be a perfect process, it's an evolving process, so if we tweak the, uh, if we need to tweak the application or something for the second round, because we found that things were um, difficult or work better one way or the other, we, we will do so. Um, I wanna introduce some people that are here with us today uh, because they have been a tremendous help to me to get this off the ground. And um, they are uh, Brooke Smith from the United Way, uh, Jennifer Cuzo from, the, from Visit Lebanon Valley, uh, Susan Eberly from the Lebanon Valley Economic Development Corporation, Karen Grow from the Lebanon Valley Chamber of Commerce, and Vin Garcia from Garcia Garmin and Shea uh, accounting firm here in, in town. They have all been a part of getting the application together, the FAQ together, um, testing things, um, you know, and anything that needed to be done to get to where we are. And again, it was done in a pretty short period of time. So I'm eternally grateful for the help that everyone gave. And, and you can probably tell that we selected people from these disciplines because of nonprofit grants, because of business-related grants, tourism-related grants. So all of these people serve in those roles uh, here in our community. Um, the way we will conduct this today is um, Karen will lead us in a PowerPoint presentation that will kind of walk through the application process, some of the frequent questions, and we, we welcome your questions. Uh, Any time, if you use the raise hand function of your um, on on your screen, then I will call on you, and we can do that even while while we're in the midst of things, so that the question is relevant to what's being covered at the time. So, um, let's see if I uh, I don't know if Barb Kaufman is on here, and I don't see her on the list, but Barb has been. Uh, assisting us with the, the getting the word out and doing the radio ads and the, and the various print and, and other media that we utilize to get the word out on this program. So um, with that, I guess, uh, Karen, if you're ready to bring your PowerPoint up on the screen. Yep. We'll go from there. Okay if people type in the chat window as well, if they have a question. Sure. I'll monitor both. Mm -hmm. um, yep. If that's easier, I'll monitor both. Okay, great. So
So we're just going to walk through this. Again, I encourage you, uh, we've tried to think of as many things as possible, but if there's a question that comes up or something is not clearly explained, please uh, feel free to raise your hand or write it in the chat window. We will answer as best as we can. And if I go too fast, I can slow down. Uh, I just don't want to um, take up the whole hour with this. So, um, all right. So I think the background is pretty clear. We, this was money allocated by the federal government. Um, port, a portion of the CARES Act funding came to each state. Each state then was allowed to designate to each county. So our county was awarded $12.8 million, uh, which came from a per capita calculation. Uh, that $12.8 million has to cover a few other things, including municipalities and, and some other um, allocations. We have $7.25 million allocated to small business, tourism, and nonprofit. Um, and so these are grants, they do not need to be paid back. So this FAQ or this walkthrough is also available online at the um, LebanonCountyCares.com. Uh, so you can download it. You don't have to memorize everything on this list, but there is a list of things that you should probably have ready for when you apply, because once you start the application, there is not a way to save it. So once you get through and you hit submit, it's done. So you're going to fill out the application at LebanonCountyCares.com. We highly encourage you to do it online, although if you are unable to do it online, there is a paper application that can be picked up um, at uh, Garcia, Garvin, and Shea, or you can download the paper application. But when you do it online, it's your words, it's your input. If it's on paper, we have to transfer it over as well. So we would rather that you do it online. But if you do have to pick it up, you can pick it up at 216 South 8th Street in Lebanon during business hours. Um, and all of these things, there's an FAQ, the application, and this walkthrough is available at LebanonCountyCares.com. So a couple of basic things on the FAQs. Um, there are two rounds. The first one is from September 1st to the 15th. Round two is expected to open October 15th. Um, applicants that are not awarded a grant in the first round may apply again in the second round. It's important to note that you will have to reapply again. We do not just carry the applications over, uh, so keep that in mind. Um, I already mentioned the FAQs and the online application. If you have questions after this walkthrough and reading the frequently asked questions, you are welcome to call Garcia, Garmin, and Shea at the phone number that's listed there. They are our point person to help answer questions that you may have. Questions with an asterisk are required, um, and the funding that you, that you use the grant money for must be used by December 30th of this year. Um, applicants, uh, applications are not on a first come first serve basis, so whether you turn it in on the 1st of September or the 15th, you are looked at equally. Um, so you may complete your application at any time. Make sure that it arrives in person by 4 p.m. on the 15th. If it's still in the mail um, and it arrives in the, on the 16th, it doesn't count. Um, if you stop at the office at uh, Garcia Garmin Shea at 5 o'clock, it doesn't count. It's got to be by 4 o'clock. That's our deadline. Um, and they must be complete. If there are documents required, please make sure that you upload all documents that are asked for. Once your application is in, there is no changing it. So that's why we've provided a list of the things that you want to gather in advance. Um, so just make sure that you have things complete. So eligible expenses. So the grants can be used to cover necessary working capital costs or for retrofitting expenses occurred or to be incurred until December 30th of this year. It can include payroll, rent, mortgage interest, utility, bill, cable, internet, phone, spoilage, PPE purchases, cleaning supplies, et cetera. But grant funds cannot be used to pay back loans to shareholders, partners, the sole proprietor, or family members. And for nonprofits, additional eligible expenses can include replenishing food pantries and the cost of increasing shelters. In eligible expenses, um, anything that occurred outside of March 1st through December 30th, so if there's something that happened in February, um, you, it is not eligible. Um, you may not use expenses that have been or will be reimbursed through another federal program or some other funding source. And there's a lot of them out there. So if you have claimed on another grant or loan, that well, uh, loans are, are an exception, but if you've claimed on another grant 
that you are using it to um, purchase PPE, you may not use this money for the same allocation. If you are using it to pay rent, you may not use this for the same allocation. There cannot be double dipping. There are checks and balances, and, um, and so that it will be found out. Uh, you cannot cover damages by insurance, um, reimbursing donors for donated items or services, expenses in preparation for future outbreaks, or employee bonuses or other hazard pay, no employee compensation, no severance pay, and no legal settlement. So here's the first step on the application. You have three categories to choose. Nonprofit has to be a 501c3 or a 501c19 only. This is allocated in the Federal CARES Act. It is, there, there are no other um, 501s that are eligible and it's completely out of our control, but there has to be documentation that you are in one of those two categories. The other one is tourism and hospitality and the other one is small business less than 100 employees. If you're not sure whether you fit into small business or tourism and hospitality, just pick the one that most likely, uh, that, that most closely represents the majority of your business income. And if it doesn't quite fit in there, that's okay. We, we will accommodate as we can. You're going to put in question number one, your legal name of the business. If you have a DBA, you can add it in in the business DBA section as well. Your employer identification number, your EIN goes in there. If you don't have one online, you're going to enter all zeros, but then you must provide your social security number. So there's a, all of the fields have um, to be filled in as long as they have an asterisk and uh, everything else I think is pretty self-explanatory. Any questions here? We're good. Okay, so the next thing, we are looking to just kind of see what industry you're in. There's, this is absolutely not a complete list of industries. Um, we are just trying to see, there are some industries that have been hit much harder um, during the pandemic and closures. So just trying to get a general idea. If you don't fit into one of these industries, feel free to fill it in under the other. Brief summary of goods. Um, services and goods produced. This is just so that if we don't know your business, we're just trying to get a little bit of an idea. So it's a brief description. Just give us the, you know, the spiel on, on what you provide or what you, what services you offer. Your NAICS code. And I know some people really aren't sure about this. I've never heard of it before. They don't know where to get it. There is a search option online. If you click on the link, you can search based on um, your industry. It's a six digit number. Um, and again, it's just for us to kind of track the kind of businesses that are applying for this. First year of operations. Some places aren't really sure. So we just ask you to estimate as, as close as possible. If you are, this is your first year, that's okay as well. If you opened your business in 2020, put that in as well. It does not have to be a business that has been open for a full year. Number six um, and 6A, we're looking for your full-time employee count as of March 1st and your part-time employee count as of March 1st. March 1st was a Sunday, so if you are looking to see who was on payroll for March 1st, you can always go to March 2nd. That's entirely up to you. Keep in mind that um, employee headcount includes full-time and part-time employees for which you issue a W-2. Subcontractors are not included in your headcount but the owner is included if you work in the business. Down here, this is again, um, it's, it's often information that is captured on a federal grant that they would like to know, uh, you know, kind of who is applying. Is it completely optional? You do not need to fill that out. It makes no difference whatsoever on your application status. So basic information, your business location, you must have a business location in Lebanon County. Um, if you're not sure of the municipality, I'm sure we can figure that out, but you will have to find it out and put it in. Um, if your business location is different than your mailing address, you're going to fill in the next section. You see that that does not have an asterisk. If you don't have a different mailing address, you do not need to fill this in. The primary contact is the person that you would want to be contacted in the event that the grant is issued. Who is that point of contact? It may be you, it may be somebody different as you might be filling the application out for them. So we're looking to find out if this is a business's um, 
only or headquarters location in Lebanon County, or if you, this is a branch location in Lebanon County and the majority of your business is somewhere else. That's all that that is for. On the legal structure, you can pick multiple choices here. You might be a sole proprietorship, it's an LLC, whatever fits for you or most closely fits. Again, it's not crucial, we're just collecting some data there. It does not affect your application, but you do need to select something. Financial impact information. Um, this is uh, such a critical point. This question um, is really important because this is where you become more than just the numbers. Um, this is for you to describe your current and projected future impact of COVID to your operations and your intended use of funds. This is your narrative. This is 20% of all the applications. So every application has a different rubric. This part is 20% of your rubric score on your application. This is where you get to say what is, has been so important to you and, and why you need the funds. If you can you know, divide out and say, I need this much for rent, I need this much for utilities, um, and this much for PPE, put that information in. Um, if it's just some generalities, try to describe as best as you can so that we have an idea of what the money will go towards or what it needs to replenish. But this is really the place that you uh, tell your story. This is where you separate yourself from others. So question 17, total revenue from March um, 1st to July 31st, 2019. We are looking to see how your financials last year compared to your financials this year. So if you were not operational last year at this time, just put in a zero. Um, and when you're filling this in online, it's just numbers only. So again, we need to see any revenue that you had this year from March 1st to July 31st. That difference in that loss in revenue may have an impact on the scoring of your application. Question 18, total operating expenses reported on your most recent year submitted tax return. Um, it should be pretty clear for you to find it. However, if you do not submit a tax return, if you are, have not been in business long enough to submit a tax return, we ask you to use your most complete profit and loss statement and put your um, expenses from that down. You will then need to submit that instead of a tax return. Uh, but that is only if you don't actually um, submit a tax return. If you have one, that is the first priority. If you don't have a tax return, you have an alternative, which is uh, to use your most complete profit and loss. If you've only been open for business for 10 months, that's what your profit and loss is gonna be based on. Um, if you've been open for more than a year, then you need a full year's profit and loss. And number 19 is net profit or loss. Um, it's often on line 31 on Schedule C or revenue less expenses, line 19 on a 990. Some each uh, kind of business um, has a slightly different tax return. If you have any trouble finding it on yours, you're certainly welcome to call Garcia, Gurman and Shea and they can help you find it. Um, again, if you do not have a tax return, we ask you to put down your net income from your most recent and complete profit and loss statement. It needs to be as close to a full year or a full year of profit and loss as possible. If you had a loss, you're going to put a negative sign in there and show that it was a loss. Please don't put in that you had uh, you know, $5,000 uh, without the negative sign because it's going to look like that was um, 5,000 as a positive income. So the amount of grant requested, we have allocated based on revenue, uh, how much you can apply up to. So this was a chart that we used based on what the state of Pennsylvania used for their small business um, assistance grants. And uh, we carried that over to our county. So if your annual business revenue is up to $50,000, your grant allocation is up to 5,000. It does not mean that you have to ask for that much money, it means that that's the cap on where you can ask for money. Um, so it goes up to $50,000 is the highest grant request, and that's for any business that's $850,000 and up. We have, a, we have it at a million there, but it's really a million plus. So if you, make, um, if you have a revenue of over a million, you are still capped at that $50,000 grant request. Um, 
this is really important that you match this with your revenue statements that you are going to provide to us because if the two don't match if you ask for an allocation outside of what your annual business revenue is it's going to go down anyway so you really can't ask for out of that with an exception you'll see at the bottom of the page here that we have a check this box if your need exceeds the maximum grant request allowed for annual revenues this is kind of the the situation that you might find your business is in such an extraordinary circumstance that you want us to know that 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 grant cap is just not going to be sufficient. And again, it goes back to that narrative. If you tell your story well enough, we will understand. But if you go outside of the grant allocation per revenue, because you have a specific reason, you have to check that box or we will not know that that's why you put in a higher amount. There's no guarantee that you will get that higher amount. Um, there's no guarantee that anybody will get the amount that they request, even if it's in their revenue category. Um, but it is certainly a place for us to start. So please make sure that you understand what your annual business revenue is and the grant allocation that you can apply for. And I'm going to pause there for a minute because I think that's really important. And I want to make sure that there's no questions on that. Don't see any. Karen. Yes. For, uh, for discussion purposes, okay. Um, let's say you receive an application and it has over a million dollars worth of uh, worth of revenue, okay. And they've checked the box or uh, applied for fifty thousand dollars. That that was the grant that they're looking for, okay. Um, meanwhile, in the discussion points in the narrative. They describe uh, expenses of thirty-five thousand dollars that they would that they anticipate or, or uh, ha would have eligible expenses between um, now and and the end of the year. How is that reconciled during the review process when they when they providing a narrative that comes up to a thirty-five thousand dollar number? and an ask for 50,000 based on their million dollars of revenue. Do you want me to jump in on this or does anybody else want to? Uh, this is Jamie. I mean, it's going to have to still tie back to expenses that are related to um, COVID-19 or, or you know, eligible expenses un under the act for that. It, it's, it can't just be a an ask over and above for extra money. I guess I would say is that accurate, Karen? Yeah. So at the at the end of this process, ultimately, whatever money you accept, you are going to have to justify. So if you have asked for, if you think right now, and you can describe in your narrative that you only need thirty five thousand, but you ask for fifty, by the end of the year, you have to provide valid documentation that that $50,000 was spent on qualified expenses um, under the CARES Act and under the guidelines and the application. So you want to make sure that you forecast, especially if it's something like cleaning supplies or PPE or additional personnel to handle anything COVID related, <clears throat> that you might forecast ahead on that. But you can't just keep an extra pocket of money in the event that something else may come up. You have to really be able to justify it. By the end of the year, you're going to have to turn in some kind of documentation detailing that. Does that answer it, Ben? Yes, yes, that, uh, that does it. Okay. Are we ready to go on or do we have any other questions on this? I don't see anything further right now. Okay, so this is another question um, about previous grants already been or that have already been allocated or are promised. So, for example, if you received um, Paycheck Protection Program money, which came from the CARES Act, and you are sure that you are not going to keep it as a loan, if you are sure you are going to apply for forgiveness on it, in which case it becomes a grant, that has to be included here. If you got the idle advance, which is not a loan, that is a grant that was up to $10,000. That was also CARES Act funding. 
Um, if you receive any other funding through CARES Act grants only, then you have to allocate it in here. Um, if you received anything that was a loan, if you took the Paycheck Protection Program or the EIDL loan, that does not count here. If you have a bank loan, that does not count. Anything that you have to pay back, it's entirely up to you. Uh, but this is for grant allocations only for money that was received um, under the CARES Act. So if it's a CARES Act grant, then you need to include that in here. Number 23, what, uh, this is for nonprofits only. Um, and it was really important, Brooke, I don't know if you want to talk anything about this, but it was very important that this became part of the nonprofit story. Sure, I can, I can share a little bit about that. Um, you know, a lot of our nonprofit partners, us included, you know, a big piece of our revenue is related to fundraisers and events. And during this time, certainly, um, I know many of our um, nonprofit partners from across the county have had to adjust, they've had to cancel, and, and it has left, uh, you know, a, a big gap in people's operating budgets. And so we wanted to take that into account and make sure that we're capturing that as part of the bigger picture for uh, you know, the situation financially these nonprofits are in. Thank you, Brooke. And you'll notice that even though it has an asterisk, if you are applying and you check the box for tourism or small business, you won't even see these questions. So even though they're required, if you are not applying under nonprofit, they will not show up. So the same thing goes for the, uh, the next question, number 24. Again, it's for nonprofits only. Confirming your res re registered designation. This also goes back to the CARES Act stating that only uh, 501c3s and 501c19s are eligible. All right, did something you, pop up? Karen, you have a couple of questions. Did you want to answer them now or at the end? Um, so I think I can see them here. So if you did not, the, the first question is if you did not get funding for hazard pay, you are saying that we could request that funding to our employees through this grant. That is correct. If, as long as your employee pay has not been covered under anything else that you are requesting for. So if it's a chunk that you're looking for that wasn't covered under PPP or hazard pay, then that can be part of this as long as it fits in eligible expenses. Um, I don't know if the, the question specific to the fundraising events, I'm not sure who typed that in there, Vicki. Would you mind to just unmute and ask? I'm not sure I'm understanding. The full so if we had, we have um, donors who give annually um, and we have their commitment, but if we have donors who specifically did not give that donation this year and they said it was because they could not give it because of COVID, can that be? So it's something that we have budgeted in our fundraising budget, but we did not receive it because the, a donor or donors said that their income was impacted and they could not give it this year. So they've committed to pledging a certain amount, but they're not going to fulfill it because of COVID. That's correct. I mean, yes, we're going to be in a similar situation. Um, yeah. I think it's really important to make sure you're highlighting that in your narrative. And at the end of the day, at some point, that's going to show up in your, you know, your revenues, I would imagine. So thank yeah, I, I think just make sure that you're spelling that out clearly in the narrative piece. Okay, and thank I, you. I would add in as well that if you look at that question, it says canceled fundraisers or events and or events. So to me, a campaign that somebody has promised money but is now backing out as part of that fundraiser, which doesn't have to be an in-person event. Would you agree, Brooke? So that money that was promised but isn't coming in can go into this dollar figure? On I would I would think so. I just think the more the more detail you can provide in the narrative piece to make just bring clarity to whoever is looking at it, I think would be helpful. And and Vicky, while we're still on this, uh, if you have actual pledges, I don't know the kind of uh, campaign you're referring, but if you have actual pledges uh, that weren't filled yeah. or some documentation of the pledges, that would probably be helpful. Okay, thank you. Go in there from uh, Amy and <clears throat> Becky. Yeah, we have another question on if you receive PPP to cover payroll in May and June and have used all those funds up, can you use this funding towards payroll for October and November? Absolutely, you can use it for other COVID related expenses that weren't covered under PPP. Like if you use that up, you know, May and June, 
you obviously can't use those uh, those months, but other months that weren't covered, you can use it for as long as, again, everything falls under the guidelines um, that are written out here. Karen? Yeah. Going back to the uh, previous question, the um, loss of revenue uh, as it relates to the amount of grant that you're asking for, if your revenue is down $20,000, and that's the only change between this year and last year, your expenses are the same. Would you qualify for a grant to replace the revenue that you did not receive? So if I understand correctly, you're saying that if you, let's say you still have enough income to pay all of your expenses, are you allowed to use the grant to potentially have a profit? Well, just to replace, uh, as, as it relates to the prior um, question, donors who did not make their pledge, okay? So there was a loss in revenue because of COVID. Right. Is this grant intended to replace what they would have expected to receive? I, I understand that the grant is intended to cover expenses that would have been covered by that fundraising money. So in other words, it's not, it's not a dollar for dollar. It's not, um, we're not trying to say, well, you would have made this much money, so we're going to cover that complete loss. If it has to cover expenses um, it can't just go back into the bank so that there's a profit. So the question, so let, let me just kind of go back to the question number 23. The reason that this is asked is because it has an effect on nonprofits. It really has a tremendous effect and it might not even show up yet, especially if a nonprofit has a lot of events more in the fall. And so that might not show up yet on the change in revenue from the previous questions. So that's why that was in there. That doesn't that is not calculated in how much somebody is allocated in a grant but it is a factor in the scoring rubric on the need for that nonprofit so while we're asking for that dollar figure that isn't to replace that money that dollar figure is to show what has become out of a nonprofit's control that they had expected I, Karen, if I can just add on to that, I mean, I think to, to Vicki's question and to her point, you know, the period of time that we're asking you to show um, revenue and expense, you may not see the uh, unfulfillment. That might, might not hit your budget until after that period of time. Um, and so I, I think we wanted to make sure we're capturing that as well. Does that, does that make sense? Am I explaining that correctly? You know, so, so that period year to year, um, you, you may not see that loss. You might only see that a little bit later, but still before this December timeframe that we're looking at. So we wanted to make sure that that is a consideration. I know we have a number of nonprofits on there. Does that help to answer that? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. And we can always go back as well and clarify on things. So question 25 is open for everybody as well. Um, this says, what are your unbudgeted expenses to date as a direct result of COVID? So even if you've purchased PPE that you know you're going to use in the future, what have you actually written a check out for, sent a charge, uh, done a, put a credit card charge on, whatever that is, on your unbudgeted expenses as a direct result? So that could be PPE, cleaning supplies, partitions, technology to do remote work additional personnel hired for mitigation efforts and whatever else that looks like. If you would not have normally done that, but you had to, to comply with guidelines and CDC recommendations, then that goes into that number. Again, it doesn't allocate a specific grant amount. It just helps to tell your story. Um, were you considered an essential business during Pennsylvania stay at home orders? It's either yes or no. And what that means is if you look at the governor's guidelines, when the list was put out, if you were on that list to stay open or you received a business waiver, a permitted waiver to reopen early outside of your business category, you were considered essential. The same thing for nonprofits. If you were considered essential and you stayed open, even if you altered how you handle things, 
um, then you were considered an essential business under the governor's guidelines. If you, you know, for example, the chamber, we were open, but we weren't open to the public and we worked remotely. We were not an essential business. We could not check no or yes, uh, but we still cont continue to work. The difference is, were you essential and had to stay open with access to the public? Karen, before you go too far off of uh, further down the questions, could you go back to question 22? Yes. I just want to clarify. Um, receiving, if they've received other CARES funding, is, it, is that specifically PPP or IDLE Advance, though only those two? Um, so that's kind of a gray area because the delineation of it being PPP or idle came from DCED documentation. Yeah. But I have seen it elsewhere that they are looking for all CARES funding. And it could have been that that PPP or idle advance was listed because at the time that was the only ones that had actually been um, distributed. Yeah. I think we need to make a firm decision on that and decide if it's just those two. And there may be more clarification uh, from DCED. I just want everybody to understand that this, that even DCED, who is administering this on behalf of the state, was bombarded with questions from counties, all 67 counties that are administering this. So, um, you know, they're struggling to get answers down to the counties with questions that are coming at the, from the local level. So maybe we'll have some clarification on things like that between now and determination time. And so I would, I would say that, again, this does not change your grant allocation. It is scored in the rubric. Um, but the bottom line is, no matter what, you cannot use CARES Act funding to cover the same expense twice. So fill it out as best as you think. But in the end, when you're designating, if you receive the grant when you're designating that, remember that you cannot use the same, uh, they can't use that to allocate the same expense on different CARES Act funds. So if a dollar, if you spend a dollar that came from CARES, you can't spend another dollar on the same thing that came from CARES. Correct. Yeah. So we have a question on um, from Verna. Three quarters of our staff were essential, but we had to close our two three eight zero program. How do I answer this? What's your Verna? What's your twenty three eighty program? Switch. <clears throat> Mute. Oh, their their adult day program. But Verna, were you was your organization one of the? I know many nonprofits were still like on the list to be operating during this time. Were there other portions of your operation that were on that list from the governor? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Hi, yes, Verna. Yes. Yes. Then I would say yes. Say. Yes, we're, we're essential. Yes. Okay. Yep. Right. right. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Current operating status. So as of the day that you fill out the application, are you not able to operate at all? Um, are you a restaurant or somewhere else that based on capacity, you can only go up to 25% or up to 50 or up to 75% based on um, the state or federal guidelines that you, you have to have certain limits on the number of people <clears throat> That's where you're going to fill that in, or you, can you operate at full capacity? And that's just a best estimate. You know, we, we don't have to have a, we don't have to do every single head count, but what do you think? <clears throat> so document uploads. This is where you need to provide your supporting documentation. So these are required. If you do not supply three documents, um, and for nonprofits, there might, there's a, often a fourth, but you, then your application is not considered complete. So you need to include the March through July 2019 and the March through July 2020 revenue document sheets that show your, your income. Um, and that was one of the questions earlier, what was your revenue? You now need to support it with a document. It can come from uh, a scan of your own handwritten allocations. It can come from QuickBooks or any other accounting software, but it needs to be the same information that you use to provide that answer in the previous question. 
You have to have something to back it up in writing. You also need to include your most recent federal tax return. It might be 2018, it might be 2019, it depends on if you filed yet for the year. This is for business or tourism only. Uh, but whatever is your most recent business tax return needs to be included. If you haven't been around long enough, if you're a newer business and you have not submitted one, you must provide your most recent full year financial statement or as full as long as your business has been in business. So if you've only been open for 10 months, again, provide your financial statement for 10 months. If, you have, if you've been in business um, for a, a year, or you don't do a tax, you haven't done a tax return yet, you need to have at least one, one year's worth of a financial statement. Um, even if you start in you know, February, you can do February to February. It's whatever shows 12 months worth. Again, because that will tie back to some of your answers on the application. If you are a nonprofit, you may not file a return um, you might just do a 990. You might do a postcard that says you're, you don't have to file. We are looking for um, your most recent full year financial statement if you do not file a tax return. If you do file a 990, that's what we want. If you don't file a 990, a full year tax, uh, a full year financial statement is what we're looking for. Additionally, because there is such a federal stipulation on the kind of nonprofit that can receive this, you must provide your IRS determination letter that indicates that you are a 501c6 or a 501c19. Without those, we cannot quantify that you fit within their guidelines. Erin, uh, 501c3, I think you said 501c6. Sorry, 501c6, a c3, sorry, Brooke. <laughs> Thanks for catching that, we're a c6. Um, and I, I get so used to saying that. Thank you. A 501c3 and a 501c19. So your IRS determination letter that indicates that. <clears throat> so for businesses, 2019 revenues for March through July, 2020 revenues for March through July, um, and your most recent tax return, if you don't have one yet, your most closely up to 12 months worth of um, profit and loss statement, financial statement. Nonprofits need their 990. If you don't do a 990, um, again, a financial statement, but you also must provide that determination letter from the IRS. They can, the documents can be uploaded. They can be photocopies. If you can only take a photo and submit that, as long as they are clearly visible and readable, you can do a PDF, a scan, um, whatever they are. And if you are delivering your documents in person, you must provide copies of them. You will not get your originals back. So whatever you hand in is what we keep. Um, so whether you want to make a photocopy of it and give us the photocopy, that's fine. But just know that you won't get them back. That's kind Eric, of a lot of stuff. Yes. Uh, regarding self-employed individuals, is it required that they provide their entire personal income tax return or just the relevant Schedule C and uh, supporting schedules? I believe that they would only need their Schedule C. Anything that just shows the um, the dollar figures to you know to back up the dollar figures that are put in the application, so a Schedule C only. Unless anybody else has a different thought on that. Okay. <clears throat> so there is fine print. And the person who is going to sign off on this, who submits the application, is the one that has got to read through all of this. You will need to print your name and you will need to sign. You are the one accompanying all of the legal requirements on this application. So please read through them. A couple of things that are really important to point out. You must have followed all emergency orders by the governor and secretary of health and operational restrictions under the governor's reopening plan. If you have violated those, then, then the application is null and void. Um, you must follow all of the other details in this part. There's 10 points that you should really read through and make sure that you understand them. Um, there is specifically on number five, available funds are limited. Uh, there is a significant interest. Not everyone is going to get a grant. We are going to do the best that we can 
to um, distribute the money to as many businesses as possible. Uh, well, we, I say we, it's the county, sorry. The county is going to be distributing um, as, to as many businesses and, and nonprofits as possible, um, but there are going to be some who are turned away. Uh, there is a limited amount of money. Note that on number 10, um, by submitting this application, you are agreeing that it is final and it cannot be edited. That is really important. I, I mentioned that earlier. That is definitely important to remember that when you hit submit, if you forgot something or you know you realize later on that you didn't think about something, it is in there and it's done. So make sure that when you are ready to apply, which you have all the way up to September 15th, that you are ready to submit the details. And the final signature um, on the online application, you're going to print your name there. That's so that we know who is actually submitting the application. If for some reason somebody submits it for a company and they're not really uh, an authorized individual, we have a record of who's done it on your behalf. So you're going to print your name in there. And then there is a signature on the bottom um, of who is, uh, is filling out the application and is agreeing to all of the terms for it. It is a on screen. It is that you can use your mouse or you can use your finger if you have a touch screen. It's a little awkward. We're not going to compare it against anything legally, um, but uh, that's where you do need to sign. And the same thing on the print version, uh, you will need to sign the bottom and agree to everything. <clears throat> so I know we're coming up on the hour here. This is. Um, so we have a question, is the person applying can be different than the contact person? Absolutely, but you need to make sure that that contact person is aware that you are, that you are submitting the application on their behalf. So just make sure that there is a definite communication there. Um, <clears throat> the question is also posed that how long after September 15th will someone be notified that they submitted an incomplete application and would have to reapply with the next round of funding? You will definitely have time to um, know that you, were, you, that you did not receive it in the first round and that you, can, you are still eligible to apply for the second round. And um, if you, so the other question was, if a company had no intent to purchase webcams or a Zoom subscription, but they did because of the pandemic, is this an expense that can be included? I would, I would say yes. I mean, I, to me, that's definitely a COVID-related expense um, and outside of what you would, would have normally budgeted. I don't know if anybody has anything else to add to that. Okay, so the grants are going to be automatically scored, 80% um, of them scored based on this rubric. In other words, everybody will have the possibility of having 100 points or 100% on their application. However, these are the things that will skew it a little differently and, uh, and help to tell your story. <clears throat> so I'm going to let Brooke talk about the nonprofit one, Brooke. Sure. Thanks, Karen. So you'll see that the, the nonprofit rubric looks a little bit different than the small business and tourism. And, you know, as we were digging into this, you know, some of the questions we asked, were you able to operate during, you know, the, the governor's closure orders and things like that? Many nonprofits were able to, and in fact, had to continue to operate, but that really didn't um, equate to revenue for them. So if you think about like a restaurant who, who had to close during that time, wasn't getting any revenue, or a, a for-profit business that was operating, receiving revenue, it doesn't always translate into the same type of uh, a picture for a nonprofit. So we realized that we had to uh, consider those applications a little bit differently. So you'll see the narrative again um, in both the rubrics is the 20%. So there is a lot of weight in understanding the story and the details behind the numbers. Um, the cost of the unbudgeted expenses. So what type of expenses did your organization incur directly related to COVID that obviously, you know, were not in your budget. Looking again at that revenue loss due to canceled fundraisers and events. So life-sustaining nonprofit organization. So we weighted this because we want to make sure that organizations that are providing a human service are going to be weighted heavier than nonprofits that um, maybe are not providing a direct service to people in our community. So uh, for instance, an organization that is providing healthcare, a health clinic, a nonprofit health clinic, clinic 
would be weighted heavier than a, a non for profit PTO or something like that. That's just an example. Um, because we wanted to make sure the organizations that were there providing the frontline service to the people who needed it uh, were weighted a little heavier. The receipt of other funding, um, so that's also taken in, into consideration if you've already received any PPP or other um, CARES Act funds. And then number of employees is something that will be considered in both rubrics just for the 5%. So Karen, I'll let you if you want to, or Jen, want to talk about the tourism and business. Yeah, Jen, do you want to jump in there? Sure. Um, you know, I really think um, at this point, um, the small business and the tourism has um, very obvious um, examples for everything that you've covered already. I think it's important to understand that the cost of unbudgeted expenses for tourism specifically um, it's important to tell your story through the narrative and with these unbudgeted expenses, such as um, tables and chairs for outdoor restaurants to accommodate the COVID situation, tents for outdoor dining. Um, the hotels have bent over backwards with cleaning and um, processing the rooms between people. So these are really important and um, I would include it in my narrative as well. Um, to to tell the story of exactly how your lives have changed and how we've accommodated um, and adapted the business accordingly. Thanks, Jen. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's, it's kind of self-explanatory there. Everybody has the opportunity to get 100. Um, everybody will get some score in there. The, the final verdict on the grants will come from how these are um, scored. So. Um, if somebody has a, a high score, there's a good possibility that they would be definitely given a grant if they are like right at the top of the list. Uh, but however, the final um, determination on grant awardees is through the county commissioners. So there will be a review committee who looks over everything and, um, and then makes a recommendation to the county commissioners on who they think should be getting the, uh, the grants. Um, most of that is coming from this rubric. So this rubric and, the, and especially the narrative are what tells your story. They will then provide that, those recommendations to the commissioners. The commissioners will look through them and make final determinations. So a higher score does mean that you have a much greater chance of being awarded a grant. Um, a lower score means that if, you, we are, if you're lower in the um, in the list and the money for that for that allocation has run out, then you might not get the, um, the grant that you've asked for or a grant at all. Uh, we may or may not be able to award all grants. It really depends on how they all come in. So again, there's no guarantee on anything, but this is just to give you an idea of what we thought helped to tell your story and your impact. Year-over-year um, -year revenue decline is going to be a percentage, so it is also based on, um, <clears throat> it is proportional to the size of your business. So if you're a company that has a million dollars in revenue and you've lost, lost $50,000, that's a smaller percentage than a company who has 50,000 in revenue and has lost $30,000. Um, so it'll be proportional to your, to your revenue. So any questions on this? All right, I'm gonna to try to get to the last few pieces here. Um, so now you submit your application. Now what, um, they are going to be reviewed by a, by a county commissioner appointed review committee. I don't believe that that has been done yet. Um, the individuals that you see working here today have been working on the process and oversight, but we are not doing that review. We are just uh, providing guidance to this point. Uh, so the county commissioners will have a review committee. Top scoring applications will be submitted to the commissioners for a final review and vote. Um, at that time, those receiving grants will be notified with additional steps required to receive the funding. You will need to provide some documentation to the commissioners. Uh, I have not seen that yet, but you will need to provide some certifications 
before the um, funding is actually provided to you. Um, a list of applicants and their grant allocation will be made public, but no additional information about your business will be released. That is all being held very confidentially by those that um, need to review it. So any of your tax information or, or financial information um, or even your needs are not going to be released. It's strictly your name and the allocation on the uh, grant. Distribution of funds will come from the County of Lebanon as soon as possible. Again, I'm not sure what that entire process is. Jamie might wanna jump in on that. But once the commissioners approve the grants, then uh, it's up to them to process it through the County uh, Treasury. Yeah, the, uh, this is Jamie, I can speak to that a bit. The intent is to, for this first round, uh, announce the awards honor before September 30th. And then we will, from the County Controller's Office, issue the checks on a, on a county check um, that will be issued once the uh, it will also need a uh, there'll be a grant agreement that um, the grantee will need to uh, sign and that will be similar to what you're seeing in the fine print on the application uh, before the check can be issued but then we will do that and, and uh, I am anticipating we'll do that on probably a special check run not wait for the typical payables run that uh, that we do uh, every other week here at the county. We will, we will try our best to get these out as fast as we can once the process is over. Um, to that end, uh, Vin, would you mind uh, addressing the taxable component of this? Uh, each recipient will get a 1099. And yes, uh, the amount that you're awarded is taxable. So uh, we don't know where that's going to show up on your on your tax return yet. Uh, we've been given no uh, uh, guidance, um, but uh, it, it is taxable income. So there's a couple of other last minute questions that are in here. If your application is complete, but the county declines to fund you or runs out of money for grants, can you re reapply the next time? Um, I believe that you can. Uh, when we say we're you know, runs out of funds, we would, we really want to make sure that there's money left for the second round because not everybody knows exactly what their needs are right now. And so we don't want to allocate 7.25 million in the first round and then have nothing for the second round. So there, I don't think there's really a set number yet on that. I think it's going to be an evaluation on what the request is, but um, it could be that you are denied the first time, but you are definitely eligible to apply the next time. Um, <laughs> And I'll also mention there, Karen, that this is a block grant. So um, if we find that, which means that we can shift money around by category. So if we find that, that one category, we, we were making guesses virtually, and so were every other, so was every other county in the state on which of these grant categories would be the, would have the most demand. And so uh, if we find that one is heavier than another in terms of the, the requests, then we can shift some funds around for the second round. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so the other thing is, I know that, that might come up in a question. If you receive money in the first round and something changes and you feel like you need more money, uh, there is a possibility you can apply for the second round, but obviously funds will be given to those first who did not get anything in the first round. If there's money left over, um, I think the whole point of this is to distribute it as best as possible to those who have the greatest need. So, um, Vicki has asked if grants were received and spent specifically related to COVID, is this captured in the year-over-year -year revenue compa uh, comparison? Um, you know, this is a really good question. I'm just going to chime in because I, I see what she's saying. If they're going to capture that in their revenue, it could actually look like more Potentially, I mean, it could boost your revenue in a, a strange way, perhaps, mm -hmm. and then it might skew the scoring that you're receiving in that area. That's a, a really good question, Vicki. Um, I don't. But I don't the money know. will come in, though, right? So if the money's come in as a grant, it's the same as if you were making sales or you had a fundraiser, right? I mean, I, I, I guess that. To your point, Karen, you know, if you're using that, if you're using that money on a specific expense related to COVID, you wouldn't be asking for more funding for the same expense. Can I clarify it? Yeah. So, yeah. So 
like so PPE yes we had some and covered that's been utilized or is being utilized so we to be able to continue operating we're going to need more but so I don't know that and maybe I missed it are we able to show that our expenses increased relative to that those specific grants so like the United Way you know we had it also facility changes some of them were made more need to be made um, all of the things related is that does that make sense does that help well, I would say, Brooke, would you agree that that comes out in the in the question on your unbudgeted COVID-related expenses? So it shows there, which is also part of the rubric. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's fine. Well, if you look here, we, it's in the rubric is receipt of other funding. Um, obviously, if you've received a lot more, you have a lower score. If you've received less, then you have a higher score. But your unbudgeted expenses as a result of COVID is 15% of the rubric. So yeah. you're, it kind of balances out the year over year revenue decline. So if you receive revenue that covers those expenses, then, then the unbudgeted expenses goes down. Is that correct? No, you would, if, you're, if, you're, if you received grants, you're going to include that in your revenue, right. but you're also then going to allocate that those expenses were unbudgeted in that cost of unbudgeted expenses as a direct result. So if you if you put out another fifty thousand dollars because of unbudgeted expenses, but you had forty thousand dollars come in in a grant, the grant money will show up in your revenue during that time frame, but the forty thousand for unbudgeted expenses or whatever I said it was will show up in that cost of unbudgeted expenses. So they'll still be there and and each have a weight. Thank you. And there was one more question in the chat so far. Um, can a nonprofit who is made up of only volunteers and does not have any employees still apply? Yes, they can. Obviously, the number of employees has a small allocation in the rubric, no matter whether you're a nonprofit or tourism or small business. I don't think any of those two would have just volunteers only. But um, yes, you can still apply as long as you are a 501c3 and a 501c19. Okay. So if you have any further questions, this would be the time. We're right about an hour. That's pretty good. Um, any other questions now, you can raise hand or raise your hand or type it into the Zoom chat. And um, if you think of something afterward that you wish you had asked, you can use the info at LebanonCountyCares.com to post that question and someone will get back to you with the best of our ability to get back to you with the answer. And again, this is, uh, we recorded this session. It's going to be posted to Lebanon County's YouTube channel. We will then capture that link, make it available, um, probably even e-blast that out to make it available to anyone who might want to follow along and get some questions answered by, by rewatching this. And same at six o'clock. We're going to have another one in two hours for anybody who maybe couldn't make the daytime hours and it's more available to this evening. Uh, we just had one more. So will there be enough time to apply for the second round if we did not receive the first? Uh, the timing for the second round is there's going to be a two-week period between the award of the first round grants and the beginning of the second round. So the September 1st through 15th round will be awarded by the 30th. And then the next round will start uh, October 15th to October 30th, awarded by November 15th. Does that answer your question, Phil? Well, I don't think Phil has a, um, a speaker or anything. Oh, okay, all right. So. I think that's what he was asking. So you'll have sent, yes, okay. He said he, that answered the question, all right. You'll have a two week period in between to sort of uh, regroup and decide if you need to apply to the second round. You know, I, I'd reiterate that this is not a perfect process. If we, we don't have every single answer. It's not like this is a grant that the county has done every year. Um, and we are definitely facing different circumstances than I think any of our county businesses and nonprofits have had to face. So if you can just, you know, bear with us as we. And try to get through this. Um, 
everybody involved in this is trying to do their absolute best to be as transparent and fair to all concerned. So it is something that we have talked about so many times as to what data do we capture to tell the story of our business community and what their need is so that we can best decide um, who is greatest need. So it's, that's really our intent is just to try to get the money out as quickly as possible. Karen, I would just add, and Jamie, I would add one more thing that what if there's a person on here watching and their revenue is on the low side and, uh, you know, up to eligible up to 5,000, but they only have expenses of, let's say, 1,500 or $1,000. Is their request going to be weighted lower because of the small amount or is it still worthwhile for them to apply for the funding? Well, it depends on the other things. If it depends on their year-over-year -year revenue decline. It depends on this, the narrative that they tell. Um, and if they haven't received any grant funding, you know, it's not strictly on expenses, but since they have to use it for expenses, that's going to definitely have an impact on how much they can ask for. If I understand the question, the, the relative size of the organization or the loss shouldn't mean a lower score or a less or less likely of an award. Good. I thought that should five, be clear. Yeah, five thousand to to a million. I mean it's it's all relative. It's all relative. So this score should hold. Okay. Any others? Does it seem so? Don't see raised hands, no more chat. Um, so again, um, Lebanon, info at LebanonCountyCares.com if you have any questions that come to mind after this. And um, please look over the FAQ if you have any before you ask that question, because a lot of the questions you know, are often answered in there uh, if you look closely. So I want to thank everybody that uh, helped to answer these questions. and. As I've been saying all along, I couldn't have gotten this far, the county couldn't have gotten this far without the help of, of uh, this circle of helpers that, that have uh, lent their time and, and uh, put in so much work. So we'll probably finish up there. Anyone else have anything uh, finally to say? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Again, we'll, uh, we'll post this to the county's YouTube and we'll make the link available for anyone who may have missed it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.